Tennis, you can go ahead and start. Exodus chapter 3, I think we'll start. Hallelujah. Exodus chapter 3. Um, seems like there's more tension in me than... than uh, than what I thought was going to be today. So I'm not sure what that's all about. Okay. Exodus chapter 3. Anybody have any extra paper I can use for writing? Yeah. So, God has appeared to Moses in the burning bush uh, and uh, he's explained to uh, Moses what he's getting ready to do so he says in uh, verse 7 of chapter 3 of the book of Exodus it says the Lord said I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. That's a verse right there that will just preach. Yes, yes. Uh, it really, it's not what we're going to talk about today, but God sees and knows about our misery. God knows about what's going on in your life. God knows about what's going on in our country. God sees, God hears, and he understands exactly what is happening. He knows what's going on. He knows why it's going on. Yes. And he knows what's going to come after it goes on, mm. which is the best part. Mm. Yes. So God knew what was going on in Egypt with his people. God knows what's going on in our life. God knows what's going on in your life. So he says in verse 8, he says, Because I've heard and I've seen what's going on, I've seen their misery, I've heard their crying, and I know why it's happening. And he also says, I am concerned about their suffering. Mm -hmm. So God sees, God hears, God knows. Mm -hmm. But he's also concerned about it. That means he cares about what's happening. He's not just up in heaven waiting for things to play out and waiting to see what's going to happen. He's concerned about it and he's involved in what's happening. So he says in verse 8, because I've seen, I've heard, and I'm concerned, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. Yes, right. A land flowing with milk and honey, mm -hmm. the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. This is one of those chapters in the Bible It's just hard for me to get through. Because every, every verse, every sentence, every thing, I want to stop and and absorb it. I'm going to let the truth of what God is saying here speak in. Not only is God an all-seeing, all-knowing, he hears everything, he's concerned, but he also has a plan. He has a uh, he has a, a, a already planned out what he's going to do about us. So he says, I'm coming down to rescue us. He's coming down to rescue his people. Yes. How many of you ever feel like you need rescuing? Yes. Yeah. yeah, amen. Yes. Well, I'm telling you, God is coming down to rescue his people. And uh, we are literally looking forward to that. When yes. Jesus Ooh. comes down and rescues us. When yes. he comes back, yes. he's coming back in the clouds and he's coming back to rescue his yes. people. He has seen, he has heard, and he knows, and he is coming back. Yes, he is. And, uh, you know, the world has sort of been allowed to be lulled to sleep by this. They, they, they sort of think, well, you know, God, it's, we've been saying this now for generations, mm -hmm. for years, and for generations, we've been saying Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. And so they say, well, he hasn't come back yet, so that probably means he isn't coming. 
No, it just means he hasn't come back yet. Yes. And it means he's still coming. He's still yeah. on the way. Our soon is and, his soon. and he is coming back. He's coming back to rescue us from this world. Yes. Mm. Um, the older I get, the more exciting that gets to yes. me. Yes. Like I said, I, I'm, I'm still not to what we're going to talk about today because I get hung up on this stuff. <laughs> It says, so he's coming back. He says, and now, I like that word now, mm -hmm. because it means something is getting ready to happen right now. And uh, I want to say to you today, God is getting ready to make something happen. Yes. God yes. is getting yes. ready to make something happen. Last week, I feel like today is sort of... Uh, uh, not a sequel, but it's almost an extension of what yes. we talked about last week. Because yes. last week we talked about what God is birthing in us. Yes. God has birthed something yes. in us. Yes. Yes. And uh, there's something new growing inside of each one of us. There's something that we can't explain it to ourselves. We can't explain it to other people. Mm -hmm. But something is stirring inside of us. Yes. And uh, God says, now... The cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Now put yourself in Moses. Well, you can't put him in Moses' shoes because by this time Moses had taken off his shoes. Do you remember the story when he when he came to the burning bush? Uh, the first thing God said was, Moses, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground. Uh, I just I need to stop for just a minute here. Um, I feel like we're on holy ground, yes. and we need to pray. Father God, right now, yes. Lord, cleanse our hearts. Yes. Lord, yes. purify our hearts. Yes. Lord, purify our yes. thoughts. Lord, I pray right now that that the truth that you would that you're about ready to give us is is we need to be pure to receive it. We need to be on holy ground, Lord. We need to understand and realize that you are a holy God. You are uh, not a God that winks at sin. You're not a God that's going to put up with it forever. And Lord, right now I pray that each one of us would just be pure and holy before you. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for coming and dying. Thank you that we can come to a holy throne because our sins have been forgiven. They are under the blood. And because they are under the blood, we can approach a holy God. Yes, Lord. And Lord, we rely on that blood. We, we trust the blood of Jesus. Yes, yes, and Lord, right now, I just pray for cleansing in each one of our hearts and our minds. If there's any impure thought in us, Lord, if there's any impure motive in us today, right now, I just, I, I, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that you would, you would purify us. Amen. Thank you. So Moses, uh, Moses, is has met God after after 40 years in the wilderness after 40 years of taking care of his father-in-law's sheep in the backside of the desert Moses has come face to face well more or less not quite face to face yet later on he's gonna come face to face but he's come face to bush with God he's come he's he's he has heard the voice of God uh, God has gotten his attention God has spoken to him and God and Moses have had this conversation and God is telling Moses what he's getting ready to do now put yourself in Moses place here because I think a lot of Christians are are with Moses right up to this point because God has been explaining to Moses all the things that he's going to do and he says I've I've seen my people's misery I've heard their cry I have felt their pain. I have, I have felt their sorrow. And I'm concerned about it. And I'm right now, he said, now, today, I'm getting ready to do something about it. And I can imagine Moses is like almost all Christians. He's sitting in the pew, and he's like all on board with everything God's getting ready to do. He's sitting there, and he's like, yeah, woo, 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 woo. You go, God. I'm with you on this. Let's, you go, you go. Because God has been telling him what he's going to do. And our churches are full of people that are all excited about that. We go to church, and we sit, and we enjoy the worship, and we enjoy the praise, and we enjoy uh, listening to the Word of God, and we love to hear the promises of God. 
I do. Mm -hmm. I love hearing about what God's getting ready to do. Mm -hmm. And I can put myself in Moses' shoes here. So he's all excited. Remember, Moses, 40 years ago, saw exactly what God is talking about. Mm -hmm. Moses, 40 years ago, saw the plight of his people. He saw the plight of the Israels in Egypt. He saw the misery. He heard the cries. In fact, Moses, 40 years ago, tried to do something about it under his own power. Remember the story? If you go back and read in, in uh, Exodus chapter 1 or 2, uh, I, you'll have to look it up. Read the story. Read the first four chapters of Exodus. So you'll get the whole story. So Moses, 40 years ago, as an Egyptian, saw the, the, the Israelites being oppressed, and he tried to fix it. He killed an Egyptian who was an oppressing an Israelite. It didn't work out very well for Moses. And so Moses had to leave Egypt right before he was strung up. They were going to kill Moses because he killed an Egyptian. So Moses, as he's listening to God, I'm sure Moses is not only cheering God on and he's all excited, finally God's getting ready to do something, but maybe in the back of his mind he's saying, well, look who finally showed up. Look who kind of finally got to the party. God finally got to where I am because I saw this happening 40 years ago. Mm. And so Moses at this point is all excited about what God is getting ready to do. And, and we're sitting here today, and when we read those verses, and I say God is getting ready to answer the prayers of his people. God is getting ready to do something about the sorrow and the suffering and the misery that is, that is overtaking our world. God is getting ready to do something about what's going on in our country. God is getting ready to do something about the oppression that is oppressing Amen. Christian, God's people, yep. all over the world. Yep. And, if, and, and if you don't realize or understand what's going on, you need to wake up and realize that all over the world, God's people are being oppressed. Yes. Right now, there are places in this world where Christians are being not only persecuted, they're being put to death. Yes. They're being killed for their faith. Yes. And we need to understand and realize what's going on in the world. But we also need to understand and realize that God knows what's going on and God is getting ready to do something about it. God is getting ready to show up. Yes, he is. And he's getting ready to show out. So we're like Moses. We're like, yeah, God, you go. You go, God. I, I'm, I'm all for it. In fact, I was already there 40 years ago and I tried to do it. You didn't help out and so it didn't work out very well. I got my hand slapped and I had to leave town and now here I am 40 years later, older and wiser. And so I'm finally glad, God, that you are finally catching on. <laughs> so I understand how Moses must have been feeling. He had to be excited. He had to be happy that he was finally getting to see God go to work. But then all of a sudden, in verse 14, the brakes get hit. The, because in verse 14, oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, okay, so let's go back. Verse so in, in verse 9 it says, Now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. This is God talking. And I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. But in verse 10 it says, So now, there's that word now again. Pay attention to the word now because now is today. So now God says to Moses, Go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. Talk about a buzzkill. <laughs> Moses is all excited about what God's going to do until God, all of a sudden, <laughs> in the middle of the conversation, drops a bomb on him. He says, because of what I'm getting ready to do, here's what I want you to do. I am sending you to do all the things that I just told you I was going to do. Yeah. And Moses responds exactly the way we respond when God gives us something to do that we can't do. Because Moses immediately realizes this, 
job is way bigger than what I can handle. <laughs> but I want to tell you something today. God is calling you to do something. Yes. And that something that has been birthed in you is going to be bigger than you can handle. Mm -hmm. It's going to require more than what you have to give. Mm -hmm. It's going to require talents that you don't have. It's going to require abilities that you don't have. It's going to require more than what you have. So when God tells Moses, today, now, I am sending you to, to set my people free. I'm sending you back to Pharaoh. I'm sending you back into the lion's den. I'm sending you to save the country. I'm sending you to save the world. Moses hits the brakes. And he says in verse 11, Moses said to God, hold on a second. He says, who am I? Yes. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now that's a legitimate question. And it's a question not only that we should be asking of ourselves, about ourselves, and to ourselves, and to God, about us, but it's also a question that's going to need answering. Who am I? Who am I? When Moses hears God's plan, as long as it was God saying, this is what I'm going to do, Moses knew God was capable. He knew that he was totally able to do everything he said he was going to do. But when God says, I'm going to use you, I'm sending you, you're the man that I want to save the country. You're the man that I want to go back and rescue my people. You're the man I want to confront the, the, the Pharaoh, the king, the world. Moses says, wait a minute. Who am I? Understand something. Moses had a huge identity problem. Moses didn't know who he was. Moses' whole life had been a struggle with his identity. If you go back and read the first four chapters of Exodus, you'll see that Moses was born to a Jewish woman at a time when it wasn't popular to be born to a Jewish woman. When Moses was born, the plan at the time that Moses was born was to throw all the Jewish boys into the river. Because the Egyptians, at that point in time, were afraid of the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Even though the, the Egyptians ruled over the Jewish people, even though they were in charge, they were still afraid of them. And so the, the Pharaoh's plan, the king's plan was to kill off all of the Egyptian boys by throwing them in the river. And so the decree had come down. When, whenever a, whenever a, a Jewish woman would have a baby, if it was a boy, they were to throw it into the river. If it was a girl, it was allowed to live. Mm -hmm. We think abortion is something that has just started happening recently. This was the same thing. This was mankind killing off little innocent babies mm -hmm. that had never had a chance to live, that had never had a chance to grow, that had never had a chance to be what they were supposed to be. It was the same demonic spirit that caused the Pharaoh, that's the same demonic spirit that's in charge of the whole abortion crowd today. Mm -hmm. Amen. This, this is not a new thing. This is not a new enemy we're facing. So the plan was when Moses was born, as a, as a little baby Jewish boy, his destiny was supposed to be short and not very sweet. Basically, and it ended up, ended up with him as a baby being drowned in the river. But God had a plan. We know the story how Moses' biological mother, when he was three months old, took Moses, put him in a basket, and set it in the river, on the, uh, in the, uh, on the side of the river, so that when the Pharaoh's daughter, the princess, came to, to bathe in the river that day, she saw the basket. She had one of her... Uh, ladies go over and get the basket. When they looked inside, they saw a little baby. The princess, Pharaoh's daughter, 
was immediately fell in love with this little baby, even though it was a Jewish baby. She said, well, this must be one of those Jewish babies. Moses' biological sister was standing over to the side. She stepped forward. She said, how would you like it if I would go find a, a Jewish mother that is, that is nursing, and she can nurse this baby for you? And so the princess who was going to adopt Moses later on, actually hired Moses' own biological mother to nurse him until he was weaned, until he was old enough to, to uh, eat on his own. So for the first couple years of his life, Moses was raised by his biological mother, not as her son, but to be the son of another woman. Mm. Talk about confusing. Can you relate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was Moses. This was Moses's early life. So, at the age of probably two or three, when Moses is finally old enough to 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 eat for himself and to sort of take care of himself, then he is taken to the palace and given over to his adopted mother, who not only was he adopted, but he was raised in a totally different culture. He was actually raised by the enemy of his own people. Talk about confusing. So for 40 years, the first 40 years of his life, can you imagine the identity issues that this man had? He didn't know if he was Jewish. He didn't know if he was Egyptian. He didn't know if he belonged on one side or the other. One side was his biological parents, his biological roots, they were slaves, and the people that were raising him, the people, the, the, the culture that he was being brought up and trained in, were the people that were enslaving his own people. And for 40 years, that's the way he grew up. And at 40 years of age, he was out, he was out uh, in the city, and he was watching the Egyptians and how they took care, how they handled the slaves, the Jewish people. He saw an Egyptian man, a master, beating on one of the Jewish men, and he couldn't handle it anymore. And so he intervened, and he killed the Egyptian. Mm -hmm. And the Egyptian, he looked around, he didn't see anybody watching, he thought he was in the clear, he buried the body, only to find out the next day when he saw a couple Jewish men fighting, and he tried to intervene again, and one of the Jewish men said, Hey, are you going to kill us like you killed the Egyptian yesterday? And right away he knew the gig was up. He knew he'd been found out. He knew that somebody had seen him. And he realized, I am in deep trouble. And when the Pharaoh found out that Moses, when he heard the story about Moses killing an Egyptian to save a Jewish person, Pharaoh said, This cannot stand, even though he is the adopted son of one of my own daughters, he said, we've got to put Moses to death. And Moses took off out into the wilderness. And for 40 years, he lived out in the wilderness. Now, what's interesting is when he got out there, he passed himself off as being Egyptian. Because when he came to his, who was going to be his father-in-law, Jethro, and he met Jethro's daughter, <coughs> And Jethro's daughter went home, and, and her father said, how come you're home so early today? And she said, well, there was an Egyptian man that helped us water our sheep. He said, well, why don't you bring him home with you? He helped us. We'll help him. Make a long story short, Moses and Jethro's daughter got married, and Jethro has two sons. The whole time, Moses has let these people think he's Egyptian. Mm -hmm. Truth of the matter is, Moses didn't know what he was. Mm -hmm. Moses didn't know who he was. And so when God came to Moses, <coughs> and God said to Moses, this is what I'm going to do. I am going to save my people. I am going to pull my people out of that swamp they're living in. I am going to rescue them from their misery. And Moses is all about, oh, great. God's finally going to do something. And then God says, I'm going to use you to do it. I want you to go today to rescue my people. And Moses says, wait a minute. I don't even know who I am. I'm not even sure whose side I'm on. 
I'm not sure what I am. And so Moses question to God is, he says, who am I? Folks, you need to understand who you are. Mm -hmm. If you're going to fulfill your assignment, if you're going to do uh, uh, reach your destiny, you have got to ask this question. Who are you? Who am I? Because the assignment that God has given us is bigger than what we can do on our own. Moses says, who am I? Who am I that you're giving me this assignment? Who am I that I'm supposed to save the country? Who am I that I'm supposed to save the world? Now notice what happens because God begins to explain some things to Moses. But he doesn't tell Moses who Moses is. The first thing he does is he tells Moses who God is. Look, at in verse 12 it says, And God said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Before you can know who you are, you have to know who God is. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Your identity comes from your Father. Mm -hmm. Your spiritual identity comes from your spiritual Father. If you want to know who you are, and you need to know who you are, yes. to fulfill your assignment, You've got to know who your father is. Yes. That means you've got to spend some time with him. Mm -hmm. You have got to know who he is, and you've got to know who it is that's sending you. Yes. Amen. You've got to know who you're dealing with. So when Moses says, who am I? Not only is he asking God who he is, he's ask, also asking God, how am I supposed to accomplish what you just gave me to do? He's telling God what we have told God. God, I know you're sending me, and I know you're giving me something. You birthed something in me that's bigger than what I know. Mm -hmm. And God, who am I, and how am I supposed to do it? Mm -hmm. How am I supposed to accomplish this? How am I supposed to fulfill my destiny? Mm -hmm. And God responds by telling Moses, who he is. He says, I will be with you. I will go with you. Moses, when God says he's going to go with them, he responds and says, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I tell them? If you're going to accomplish what God has sent you to do, you need to know the name of your father. Yes. You need to, before you can know your identity, you need to know God's identity. Mm -hmm. Now watch this, because God is getting ready to reveal to Moses a whole new facet of his identity. Mm -hmm that Moses has never seen before. That the children of Israel for, for 400 years haven't seen this part of God. Mm -hmm. God says to Moses in verse 14, I am who I am. Mm -hmm. Folks, we don't spend enough time talking about the I am mm -hmm. of God. God says to Moses, when they ask you who I am, when they ask you who sent you, when they ask you whose authority you're, you're uh, coming under, he says, you tell them, I am. I am. This was a part of God's character that, the, that, that his people had never seen. They knew the stories 
of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. They knew how God had appeared to Abraham. They knew how God had appeared to Isaac. They knew how God had appeared to Jacob. What they didn't know and what they were about to find out that God was getting ready to reveal a completely new facet to them. He was going from that to being the God of I am. God said, when they ask you who, when they ask you who sent you, you tell them I am. Mm -hmm. Folks, we have got to get back to this. God is getting ready to reveal a new, not, it's not so much a new facet because it's been around forever, but God's people have gotten away from this part of God. You see, this I am is not quite the God that the church, we the church, have been preaching for the last hundred years. We've sort of gotten away from the, the, the God of I am. You see, the God of I am doesn't laugh, doesn't wink, doesn't smile at sin. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that the God I am is not pleased with, that he's not going to put up with. Mm -hmm. And we've got to get back to that God. Now, the world was fine with us preaching the love of Jesus. Mm -hmm. The world was fine with us preaching about peace and love yeah. and acceptance and, and uh, all of that, as long as that's as far as we went. Right. Now, I'm not saying, understand, now hear me on this, I'm not saying that that is not part of God. Mm. God is a God of love. He is a God of grace. He is a God of acceptance. In fact, he's so much a God of acceptance and love and peace that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross yes. so that we could be saved, mm -hmm. so that we could have salvation. God is a God of love, but he is also a God of truth. Yes. And we have got to get back. We have got to be prepared for the God, the I am part of God, who is the God of truth. Yes. Yeah. Truth doesn't change. Mm. You, can, you can make a lie say whatever you want it to say. Whatever feels good to the person you're talking to, if you're going to lie to them, you can tell them whatever it is they want to hear. You can tell them, hey, it's okay if you're doing that. It's okay if you live that lifestyle. It's okay. We'll just call it, we'll just call it normal. We'll say it's okay. But truth is truth. You can't change truth. You can't change the I am part of God. And God told Moses, when you go back to Pharaoh, you tell Pharaoh, I'm getting ready to show a different aspect of God that the Pharaoh had never seen that the Egyptians had never seen. Even the Israelites had never seen this part of God. And, and he told Moses, when you go back there, you need to tell the people, I am sent me. And the I am part of God is tired and sick and tired and fed up with the way things have been going, and we're going to change some things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Israelites had never seen this part of God yet. They hadn't been introduced to this part of God yet. We've been preaching and teaching and learning about the Jesus that came in the manger. We've been talking about the Jesus that walked around for three and a half years and healed and performed miracles and preached love and, and preached forgiveness. And, and we've been preaching that Jesus. We also need to start preaching about the Jesus that's coming back. Because the God that was coming back with Moses to Egypt was not the same God that the Egyptians watched Moses run away from. The Jesus that's coming back is not going to be the little baby in a manger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
The Jesus that's coming back is going to be the Jesus, the God of I am. Mm -hmm. We need to start preaching both. Yes. We need to start talking about both. We are not doing the world any favors by letting them think that their lifestyle was okay right. when it's not. Right. We are not doing okay. anybody any favors yes. by telling them, hey, you can believe whatever you want as long as it feels good. Mm -hmm. You can right. do whatever right. you want as long as it feels good to you. Right. As long as you're okay with it, it's perfectly acceptable. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. And we are not doing the world any favors because I'm telling you, if you read the story of the Revelation, when Jesus comes back, if you read the end of the book, you know that it does not end well for everybody mm -hmm. yes. that is living their own lifestyle. Right. 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 There is going to be a decision that has to be made. Yeah. And we're not doing the world any favors. We're not doing anybody any favors by saying, hey, you can do whatever you want. You can believe whatever you want. Because that's not what the Bible teaches. No. And God told Moses, True. I am. True. I am is coming to Egypt. Hmm. You know, if you were in the room today, and you told me you were having a heart attack. There's a hospital that's about 10 miles, 10 minutes from here. Mm -hmm. And I could tell you, if you're having a heart attack, you need to get to the hospital as soon as you can. If you get to that hospital, they can save your life. And I could give you directions to that hospital. I could tell you, you need to go out of here, you need to go west for about three miles and then you need to go north for about a half mile then you need to go west again for about a half mile and you'll see the hospitals right there and you might say well you know what if I go west that means the sun's coming is starting to set and that means I have to travel into the sun and that's going to be uncomfortable for me and I don't really like going west so mm -hmm. so uh could you tell me another way? No, I can't. There is no other way. You might want to go east because it's more comfortable for you. Maybe you don't like the road. Maybe the road is rough. Maybe it's, maybe it's, it's congestion. Maybe it's uh, crowded. Maybe you want to go a different way. But I can tell you, yeah, you can go east if you want. But I'm telling you, you're going to go east and you're just going to travel around till your heart finally gives out and you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Folks, this is exactly what the church has done for the last most of my life. Yeah. If we've tried to tell people what they want to hear, mm -hmm. we've tried to include them and we've tried to stretch truth and bend truth to make it fit what feels good to us. And God is saying to us today, no, we've got to get back to the I am. Mm -hmm. All of it. Amen. And the truth is the truth. Yes. You can't bend it to make it fit what you want it to fit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Folks, we're in a world of hurt. Mm -hmm. Satan owns our government. Mm -hmm. Satan owns our educational system. Satan owns our healthcare system. Yep. Satan owns corporate America. Yes. Satan owns you just read this. The, the entertainment industry. Yep. Satan seems to be in control of all this stuff. We are in bad shape as Christians. And God is saying today... Now, I'm getting ready to do something. Yeah. But he's also saying, I need, I'm sending you to tackle those mountains. Mm -hmm. I know the enemy's entrenched. I know what we're up against. I know it seems helpless. How are we supposed to fight the government, the media, the entertainment industry, when all of those entities, all of those things seem to be aligned against 
Christians, against God. And make no doubt about it, that is what the enemy's doing. We have got to take back our country. We have got to become one nation under God again. Yes. Yes. And God is getting ready to do that, but he is sending us to do it. And if we're going to do it, we have got to know who we are. And before we can know who we are, we've got to know who God is. We have got to know our Father, the I Am. One last thing I'm going to share with you. Back over in uh, Exodus 4. This story has always confused me until this week. This, this part of the story, I never really got. Hmm. So after God explains to Moses, I'm getting ready to do something, and this is what I'm going to do, and I'm sending you to do it, he then explains to Moses who he is, he introduces himself, he, he puts Moses through several uh, things that helps Moses to understand that God is who he says he is. And finally Moses is ready to go. So in verse. Uh, so in verse 18 of chapter 4. It says then Moses went back to Jethro his father-in-law. And said to him let me return to my own people in Egypt. To see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said go and I wish you well. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt, and he took the staff of God in his hand. I wish we had time to talk about the staff. We don't. The Lord said to Moses in verse 21, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go then say to Pharaoh this is what the Lord says Israel is my firstborn son and I told you let my son go so he may worship you but you refuse to let him go so I will kill your firstborn son so Moses is finally on his way He's gotten his assignment. He's argued with God. He said, God, I think you got the wrong guy. I'm not the right person for this. I can't mm. speak. I stutter. I stammer. I, mm. I, I'm not very good at speaking in public. So can, can't you send somebody else? And finally, after arguing and talking with God and God explaining to Moses, I'll take care of all of the, the heavy lifting. I just need you to go and I'll take care of it. He, he explains how he's going to do it. So finally Moses is on his way. Moses doesn't know how he's going to do it. He doesn't know how he's going to accomplish it. Moses still isn't quite sure of who he is. He knows who God is, but he's still not quite sure of who he is. So God puts him through this one last thing. In verse 24, it says, At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. This has always been one of the most yeah. astounding, amazing verses in the Bible for me. Every time I read this, I'm like, what? You went to all this trouble. You, you, you set a bush on fire that doesn't burn up. You, you go through all this stuff with Moses and throwing his staff on the ground and turning it into a snake and him having to pick it up. And then you, you put his hand in his thing and it's leprosy and you put it back in and it's healed. And, and you go through all of this work and all of this trouble to get Moses on board. And finally, after arguing and, and pleading and cajoling and, and explaining to Moses who you are and explaining to Moses the, the purpose of the I am, Finally, Moses is on board. Finally, you get Moses to do what you want him to do. And he's on his way. He stops for the night. And it says God's trying to kill him. I, I never understood this because it says he was about to kill him. I, I, 
I never know God to be about to do anything. He either does it or he doesn't. Yeah. There's, it's like, it's like I always, when I read this, I always sort of picture God like chasing Moses around with a stick or something. Right? Like, Get back here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kill you. But it says God was about to kill Moses. And apparently Moses is on his deathbed at this point. And it says, he was about to kill him, but Zipporah, that's Moses' wife, took a flint knife mm -hmm. and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. Wow. So Moses is on his Moses is dying. In the middle of Moses fulfilling his destiny and, and doing what God gave him to do, God's about to kill him. And Zipporah, his wife, has to circumcise their oldest son. Now, here's what's interesting. If you go back and read in chapter 2, when Moses <laughs> had his firstborn son, he named him Gershom. That was the name of his oldest son. Gershom meant foreigner. Hmm. And the reason Moses named his son Gershom is it says because Moses felt like he was a foreigner in a foreign land. It says he felt like he was a stranger in a strange land. If you go back and realize Moses' son was born several years before this, right at the time when Moses was totally confused as to who what his identity was. And so Moses named his son, which was Moses' future, stranger in a strange land. Moses named his future a foreigner in a foreign land because that's how Moses identified himself. Wow. Moses said, I don't know who, I don't know my past, I don't know what I am now, and I don't know what I'm going to be in the future. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was totally confused about his, about what he was. Yeah. He didn't know if he was Egyptian or whether he was Jewish. He didn't know if he didn't know if he was in the world or he didn't know if he was God's one of God's people. Moses was one of those people that was sort of in and out, in and out. He didn't know where he belonged. He tried to fit in with the Jewish people, he didn't fit. He tried to fit in with the Egyptian people, he didn't fit. He tried to come back and be Jewish, he didn't fit again. Then he tried to then he tried to be Egyptian again, it still didn't fit. Then he ran off and lived with the Midianites. And he didn't fit there. Moses was a misfit living among misfits. Moses didn't even fit in with the weirdos. Moses was so confused and so so strange about what he was, he didn't fit in anywhere. You know, most of it most of us at least fit in with misfits. Mm -hmm. yeah. Most of us feel comfortable if we're around other people that don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Moses didn't fit anywhere. He didn't, he didn't even feel comfortable around people that didn't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Moses didn't know where he belonged. And so he named his future, he identified himself, he identified his future as Gershom, as a stranger in a strange land, a foreigner in a foreign land. And so... When Moses is finally on his way, by the way, there's a whole sermon in that right there. If you don't know what you're supposed to do, just start out. Mm -hmm. If you don't know where the end is, Moses didn't know how he was going to accomplish what he was going to accomplish. Moses still wasn't sure who he was. He still wasn't sure what he was going to do. The only thing different between Moses and what finally got Moses moving was he knew who God was. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know who you are yet, just start out on the journey. Start out on your assignment, and yes. God will bring the rest to yes. you. Yes. It wasn't until Moses started that God finally broke through and identified for Moses who he was. Mm -hmm. Because when Moses was laying on his deathbed, Moses' wife, Zipporah, who, by the way, was probably the one that talked Moses out of circumcising his son in the first place, When she saw that Moses was going to die, she circumcised Gershom. 
the foreigner in a foreign land. She was the one that finally took the foreskin and laid it at Moses' feet. And by that act, she was saying, and God was saying, and Moses finally accepted the fact that you are Jewish. Mm -hmm. You are one of God's people. After this, there was never any doubt in Moses' mind who he was or what he was. Now, there was times when he questioned God and what he was doing. There was times when he didn't understand the plan that God had sent him back to. But Moses never questioned his identity after this. God finally put it to rest. And God explained to Moses by this act, he said, you are Jewish. You are one of God's people. God is saying to us today, we are his people. We need to start acting like yes and we need to start living like god's people Mm -hmm. no more of this nonsense of one foot in the world and one foot in the church no more time to straddle the fence Mm -hmm. to try to appease the world Mm -hmm. to try to get along Mm -hmm. with people that are trying to kill us, Mm -hmm. that are trying to enslave us. Listen to me. Satan wants to enslave you. Mm -hmm. Satan wants to kill the eternal life that is living in you. Mm -hmm. Satan wants to destroy the world. Mm -hmm. And he is set up to do it. Now, The thing we have going for us is that Satan always overplays his hand. Mm -hmm. He can't help it. He cannot stop himself. What Satan doesn't seem to understand is he always does what God wants him to do. Mm -hmm. He cannot stop himself. He did it here because when Moses went back and explain to Pharaoh, God says, I want you to let my people go. Pharaoh doubled down. And he says, well, it'll be a cold day in hell before my people will, I'll let the the Israelites go. And God said, okay, that's the way you want to play it. It's fine by me. And the 10 plagues come and the, and the firstborn sons were killed of Egypt and the whole world saw the power of God. And even when, the, even when finally he relented, he said, go ahead, go. I can't handle it anymore. You've completely destroyed my country. And then he went out and chased them down at the Red Sea. It was like the final thing. It was the final battle between, between God and Satan. If you go back and read the 10 plagues of Egypt, you'll see that those 10 plagues, each one of them was an attack on the Egyptian gods. Every one of them represented or was tied to an Egyptian (laughs) deity. It was literally a fight between good and evil. The thing is, Satan couldn't back off. He wasn't allowed. God wouldn't let him. God told Moses from the get-go, he said, Pharaoh's not going to be able to let go. I'm hardening his heart. I don't want, I, I want this to play out. I want to see this go on. He said, I've got a purpose in the, in the, in the battle. Mm. There's things going on in your life right now, and you've been questioning you, God. You've been saying, God, why is this happening to me? Why is life so hard? Why is there such a battle? Why, do I, why, why does it seem like the enemy's always winning? Mm. I'm telling you this. Those hardships, those things, that, that suffering, that misery, God is allowing it to happen. Satan is allowed to overplay his hand because in the end, Satan will be defeated. And the very final act, the very final thing, the very final conflict between uh, God and Egypt 
God's people in Egypt was the parting of the Red Sea. And the very final thing that happened was the Egyptians, when they saw the Israelites marching into the Red Sea, and they said, hey, our deity is the God of water. This is a sign to us that our God will protect us. That's why the Egyptians pursued the Israelites into the water, into the Red Sea. Why, why in the world? Would the Egyptians ever think, if they saw that happen, if they saw the sea, this part miraculously in the middle, if it was me, I'd be, I ain't going in there. There's no way. They couldn't help themselves because they believed they had the deity on their side. They believed in this deity of water. And so they pursued them. And the very final act that God did was destroy that very last deity that the idol, the idols that the Egyptians worshipped. It was the ultimate battle between good and evil. And I'm telling you what's going on in our world today is that Satan is getting ready to overplay his hand again. He always has. He always will. Same thing happened on the cross. Satan overplayed his hand. He couldn't stop himself. You ever wonder why Satan never put Jesus on the cross? You read the Old Testament, and God said exactly what was going to happen. He told it from, from the beginning. He said, clear back in Genesis, I'm going to send the Savior, mm-hmm. and Satan will bruise her heel, mm-hmm. but his head will be bruised. Mm-hmm. The handwriting was on the wall. Mm-hmm. Talked about that a couple weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Satan, yes. Satan should have known. Mm-hmm. thing is, He can't help himself. He can't stop. The same thing is happening today. It looks like he's winning. It looks like he has all the cards. It looks like he's holding all the aces. It looks like he's got everything wrapped up and sewed up tight. But I'm telling you, he's getting ready to overplay his hand again. And God is getting ready to reverse and switch it and flip the script. And he is sending you to do it. And yes, yes, it's bigger than what you can do. It's more than what you have. But you serve a big God. You are being sent by the I Am. You don't need to apologize for him. You don't need to make excuses for him. You don't need to apologize for the truth. And it's time for God's people to quit apologizing for the truth. Now, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sometimes the truth can be hard. It's not always easy to hear the truth. It's not easy to say the truth. It's not always easy to realize that you've got to know what your true identity is. Let me say this and I'm done. God's not wanting to change your identity. He just wants to reveal to you what it has been all along. Mm. Moses didn't become Jewish this day. He was always Jewish. He was born Jewish. His biological roots were Jewish. You have always been one of God's people. What you're doing and what God is saying today, it's time for you to wake up and understand and realize exactly who you are. Yes. It starts by you knowing who God is. The I am. We are God's people. Let's start to act like it. Let's start to walk in that authority. When Moses went back to face Pharaoh, Moses still stuttered. Moses still stammered. But he had an authority in him authority that was given to him by God. And it says when when Moses spoke to the Egyptians, it was like they were hearing from God. Mm -hmm. That's what God's going to do for you. When God 
tells you to open your mouth and speak, the world is going to hear God. I don't care what your personality is. I don't care what you've been all your life or what you haven't been, or what you thought you were and didn't know. Some of, some of us understand exactly what Moses went through because our lives have been like that a little bit. We were born in one family and adopted by another, and we grew up one way, and now we're something else, and you've been back and forth, and you're a little bit confused and don't understand all these things that you've been through and decisions that you've made. Some of them have landed you in hot water, and you've ended up in the desert. You've ended up taking care of somebody else's sheep. When God called Moses, he didn't own anything. He was taking care of another man's sheep. Mm -hmm. He was wearing another man's clothes. Mm -hmm. He wasn't sure if he was Egyptian or Jewish. Mm -hmm. But God said, I'm going to straighten all that out. I'm going to straighten all that out. And it was when Zipporah circumcised Moses' son. And it's interesting. She said to Moses, you are a bridegroom of blood. Mm -hmm. wow. And you think about all the things, how the blood was going to affect all the things that Moses did. Mm -hmm. It was the blood that had to be that had to be put on the doors wow. at the crossover. It was the blood when Moses went up and received the Old Testament law. Think about all the ways that blood had to be shed yeah. mm -hmm. and Moses was finally given his mm -hmm. and revealed to him what his real identity he said you will be a bridegroom of blood to Jesus. me Jesus. a bridegroom of blood Jesus. we have listen to this we have a bridegroom of blood yeah. mm -hmm. our savior yeah. is a bridegroom of blood our Savior, the most important thing he did was shed his blood. And we have a bridegroom of blood. Father God, thank you for your word today. Lord, right now I, I pray for people in this room, Lord. You are identifying their identity right now. You have called people in this room, Lord. You have birthed things in this room. Lord, Father God, there are people that are hearing this that know there's something different inside of them. They can't explain it. They don't know where it came from. They don't know why they are uncomfortable. They don't know why that their entire life they've lived one way, and now all of a sudden they feel something burning inside of them, something that has to come out, something that is that is alive and breathing and is about ready to pop and they're ready to give birth and Lord they're not sure if they're going to be able to follow through. Lord right now I pray to you. Lord I ask that you would show them their identity. Show them first of all who you are Lord. Reveal yourself to us today Lord. Reveal the I am so that we will absolutely know 100% who our father is. Who we belong to. And whose child we are. Yes, and then, Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us our identity. Yes, Lord, Jesus. show us what we are. Show us who we are. Lord, the, the, the assignment that you have given us is too big for us. It's too hard for us. We're not, we're, we don't have the ability, the talent, to do what you've called us to do. But you are calling us to do something bigger than what we are. And, Lord, we need to know our identity. We need to know who we are. Thank you for this word today. Lord, we bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.